everyone gets AT&T's best deal on the new iPhone 14 Pro with the incredible camera. So, people currently listening to comedy podcasts, and people listening to political podcasts, and people listening to true crime podcasts who actually can't stop listening to true crime podcasts and it's ruling their lives. The point is, everyone, new and existing customers. Ask how to get up to $800 off the new iPhone 14 Pro with eligible trade-in. Visit att.com or our stores for details. Terms and restrictions may apply. That's the only outcome, right? You can only forfeit unless you manage to find new funding. Yes. Because you cannot borrow that amount. Correct. Unless you can find new funding. So mm. developers are not kind to say, oh, it's okay, your first time. It's a mistake. It's okay. You <laughs> Honest can... mistake. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honest mistakes don't come, right? Developers say, oh, sorry, too bad. Thank you for your deposit. What should first-time home buyers know about? What are some common mistakes in buying property? One particular mistake has caused people to lose their deposit. Let's find out what it is so we can avoid it. Even if you have bought property before, today's discussion will also be useful as you address common debates like HDB versus private property, resale versus new launch, and should HDB be treated as an investment? We we'll also talk about loans, the financing process, how to budget, and the core factors that drive prices in the property market. Let's hear from CEO and founder of Empower Advisory, Douglas Chow. So, based on your experience, what are some of the mistakes that first time home buyers make? Common mistake number one, not checking how much loan they can get before they even try to buy a property. So there are two ratios they must be aware of. One is the MSR, mortgage servicing ratio, which is 30%, which means that you cannot spend more than 30% of your gross income on servicing the loan. And this applies only to ECs or HDBs. ECs as in ECs that you buy brand new from the developer, right? And HDBs, of course, you buy from the government and resale as well. And the other ratio to take note of, different from the MSR is a TDSR, Total Debt Servicing Ratio. So it is actually less stringent than MSR because you are allowed to use 60% of your gross money income to service the loan. So which means for a particular income level, you can actually borrow more if you were to buy a private property. And that is also one reason why some folks decide to just get a private property instead of HDB because mm. they really can get more loans too. If you were to look at it logically, um, I think the government just want people who are buying the ECs and HDB to be very prudent. So they set a very strict criteria that your amount they use to service your loan must not be more than 30%. You can't accuse the government of being a nanny. The government just trying to safeguard um, folks from overcommitting. So as for the private market, the government allows more leeway so you can borrow up to 60% of your gross um, monthly income. Okay, so that's your take on, on why we have such policies in place. And so the main difference is that if it's HDB or EC, it's 30%. And if you're getting a private property, you can get up to 60% of your loan. Let me try to rephrase it in case our listeners get a bit confused. Mm. Um, for private properties, um, the rule is such that the debt that you service cannot be more than 60% of your gross money income, which is mm. very generous okay. compared to 30% mm. if you are buying HDB or ECs direct from the developer for ECs. Um, for HDBs, whether resale or BTO is kept at 30%. Okay, so 30%, 60%, two ratios that you should be looking out for. Yes, so if first-time buyers are not very sure, very simple, just contact... Um, the banks, and they all have mortgage specialists. They will calculate for you. Of course, there are online calculators as well. Full of online calculators, you can find these calculators on Property Guru, SRX, and all the different property platforms. Uh, but nothing beats just confirming with your so-called banker or mortgage specialist, whatever they call themselves. Because these are the guys ultimately who will grant you the loan, not the property platform based on advertisements and all these things. So check first before you even commit because I know cases of folks who don't check, they assume that they can get the loan and when they commit to the purchase, they realize that they don't have enough really 
and they end up having to forfeit um, a quarter of their deposit, which is a shame because we're talking about easily 10, 20 grand just forfeited by the developer because he didn't check. That's so, the only outcome, right? You can only forfeit unless you manage to find new funding. Yes. Because you cannot borrow that amount. Correct. Unless you can find new funding. So mm. developers are not kind to say, oh, it's okay, your first time, it's a mistake, it's okay. You <laughs> Honest can, mistake. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honest mistakes don't come, right? Developers say, oh, sorry, too bad. Thank you for your deposit, or rather a portion of it. <laughs> Next time, please do better. Yeah. So you should check, out, check a load. If you want to do it yourself, there are online calculators, but your advice would be, of course, to check with the bank directly because everybody's yes. financial situation is different. You might be servicing your car loan and other exactly. loans. Exactly. Right? And be truthful when you are telling the banks what are your obligations because all this goes into your calculation of your TDSR or your MSR. Okay. On this note, tell us about approval in principle, AIP. In principle approval, they call it IPA actually, in principle approval. Mm, okay. Um, it's just the banks giving you approval before your actual purchase of the property. But it gives you the comfort that you have submitted your documents, everything is in place. And with the real documents that you submit, which is basically your income statements, your CPA contributions, the tax you pay, they will give you an in principle approval. And with that, that that's valid for three months. And with that, you can be sure that whatever you purchase within three months, the bank will lend you the same amount of the IPA. Unless you have purposely withheld certain documents and then it's not the bank's fault if they have to revise it, you know, down the road. Mm. So this is the part where you definitely have to talk to, like you say, whether you call it a mortgage specialist, in any case, talk to your bank. That's right. Because right. they'll give you this talk to the bank. Yeah. IPA and it's valid for three months based on the information that you submitted to them, your income documents or any other loans they are servicing at the same time, right? That's right, yeah. absolutely. So when you say people don't check how much loan they can get, that means I can purchase a property and then after that, I scramble to talk to the bank. I can get a property without getting this IPA. Yes, yeah, some folks do that. Mm. Yeah, and which then is... they realize, what? <laughs> okay, yeah, but, yeah. but won't the agents remind them or something? For me, I'm agent as well. So I always tell my clients, please get your IPA. Don't assume. Don't Unless assume. they are the all cash buyers. No loans required, fine. Yeah, but if they need, I always tell them, please. So I will tell them all the case studies I know personally, colleagues, clients who got stuck because they assumed, can't get the loan, they lose a portion of the deposit, which is very silly. It's, un- it's a very unnecessary mistake to make. Mm-hmm. Oh, and for those of you who are listening to the podcast right now, right? Because uh, Douglas is wearing a mask. <laughs> You can you can check out our videos because we do put them out on YouTube and we have like different versions of a video podcast. So you can check us out on YouTube, check out the financialcoconut.com. But for those who are listening on podcasts, on Spotify, what have you, or well, you have to, to visualize, <laughs> what, what does the, the Batman mask represent? Uh, yeah, Batman fights the bad guys, right? Ah, okay. So, okay. yeah. And it's the best superhero mask to wear because at least it leaves your mouth room to move. The other masks cover everything and your voice just can't get out. Okay, so uh, Douglas is here to save the day. To remind <laughs> you of the mistakes that you might be making when you purchase your first property. Yeah, I just want you folks to just buy a first property, be happy. And if you have financial means, you go on to your second and third, fourth, whatever. That's right. It's all about asset progression and don't overstretch. So Batman is happy if you can achieve a Singapore dream, which is typically... Two properties, right? One oh, okay. to stay in, one to rent out. Mm-mm. Tell us about that that dream goal. One to stay in, one to rent out, right? Yeah, so um, from my work on the ground, people that I know, um, usually most Singaporeans start with an HDB, their first property. And after that, they accumulate more. They will buy a second property, which is definitely a private property because you can't own two HDBs. It's against the government regulations. And there you go. You have a condo which um, you might want to move in because you want a new lifestyle, um, facilities for your kids, um, security, hopefully good neighbors, but you never know. You have bad neighbors in both condo living and HDB living as well. So that's a Singapore dream. HDB and a condo. So once you have that, you can rent out your HDB because nothing beats a HDB in terms of the rental you. Nothing, right? Yeah, I think every Singaporean knows that. Okay. It's the most value for money property you can purchase if you are eligible for it. But that said, not all Singaporeans are eligible for that due to various reasons, right? You have the family nucleus uh, criteria you have to fulfill. 
And if you are a singer, you can't buy brand new from the government. Sorry, if you are a singer, you can buy brand new, but you must be 35 and above. And you can only buy a two-room HDB flat. And that also restricts your, your, your choice. So not everyone can qualify for their dream four-bedroom HDB or five-bedroom HDB. It really depends on your personal circumstances. Mm, could you tell us a bit more on the HDB and that rental is really attractive? Like how true is that and, and what makes it so? Um, well, your tenant don't really care if um, it's a HDB or a condo. If it's Okay, that really back it. Let me rephrase that. If your tenant is not so particular about having security, um, not particular about having a swimming pool in the development, a HDB or a condo is perfect. He might pay similar rental for a HDB that is convenient for him, close to good food, close to MRT because a lot of tenants don't drive. They get about uh, via public transport, like most Singaporeans, and they will pay good rental. So for example, a four-bedroom HDB, um, which means three bedrooms and a living room, near an MRT, let's say within five minutes walk, uh, can easily fetch 2.5 to 3K. Mm, okay. Which is similar to what a small condo, let's say a two-bedder might achieve. And of course, you know the price of a three-bedroom or a four-bedroom HDB is compared to a condo is way cheaper mm. and you get similar renter. But of course, you cannot compare a four-bedder condo with a four-bedder HDB because of course, the rental for the four-bedder condo will be significantly higher. But if you're comparing a two-bedder condo with a four-bedder HDB, both can fetch probably similar renter. HDB can fetch even higher renter and you don't have to pay so much for that four-bedder HDB. Now, I'm talking about the older HDB. I'm not talking about those million-dollar HDB resale that you have been uh, reading off in the news. Okay, yeah. uh, but let's let's talk about more more of an average situation that we might find ourselves in, right? Yeah, so HDBs they were built maybe in the nineties, in mm. the eighties. Yeah, if you were to buy those HDB uh, from the resale market, um, you will spend a lot less. What kind of yield are we looking at, roughly percentage? Right. Yeah, what kind of rental yield are we looking at? Of course, it depends on your purchase price. Mm. Um, but um, I mean, if you're talking about the very extreme examples, let's say some one buys a four-bedroom HDB in the early 1980s. We're talking about twenty-seven to $30,000 for a four-room flat. So can you believe it? That kind of four-room flat can easily fetch a rental of 2.5K. Now, 2.5K you times 12 is almost the buying price of the HDB. So if a rental you, geez, talking about close 100%. But those are extreme cases, right? Mm. If you talk about current HDB prices, I think the way they are priced, I'm not pro-government for the sake of it, but objectively speaking, you look at the new HDB BTOs that are priced these days in mature estates, a four-bedroom is going for about 400 plus K. So if you were to get 2.5 K rental per month, you times 12 is 30 K. 30 K divided by, let's say, 450,000. How much you is that? Jeez, it's... it's it's, it's a lot. I've got a calculator here. Yeah. Um, 30K. It's more than 10%. Divide by? Let's say 450K. Oh. Sorry, not more than 10%. That would be 45K. 6.6. 6.6. More than 5%. Yeah. yeah. More than 5. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great use. Yeah. 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 So you can't fight the kind of use. So if I were to go back in time, I wish I could have a chance to buy my own HDB. But at that point in time, I was single. You can't buy any HDB mm. at all. So my first property was a condo. Not that I wanted to, but I had no choice. But well, I turned out fine. I made money from that. So no complaints. Okay. We took a slight detour to talk about this dream. Uh, let's go back to some of the mistakes. So the first mistake you mentioned, check a loan, get the IPA. What would be another mistake that first-time home buyers usually make? Another mistake? Um, actually, I think that would just be the most... Um, most common. Most common mistake. Yeah. Because when it comes to purchasing a property, different people have different preference. You know, you can't say a guy who buys a place in Pungo is wrong rather than a guy who buys a place in central area. Because they have different needs, um, different work locations, different budgets. So there is no right 
or wrong. I think currently the, the mentality of a lot of buyers is if I buy property, will I lose money? In the past, was if I buy property, how many times can I make? Mm-hmm. So things have changed quite a bit because of the government's um, very uh, consistent messaging these days is that, especially for HDB, it's a place for you to stay. See it primarily as a roof over your head. Yeah, not so much as an investment product. But of course, everyone hopes to at least make some money from HDB, which is fine. Um, the government just doesn't want crazy speculation in that. Mm. On, on that, right? I have a question for that. But just to wrap up this part, so we are clear on the mistakes and you really encourage people to check their loans. And maybe I should phrase it this way. What should a first-time home buyer look out for? Okay, um, look out for. Okay, so besides budgeting, make sure that it is well within their means. Check what would be potential growth of the property. So this applies whether you are buying a resale property or brand new property, um, whether you are buying uh, from the private market or from the government. So growth. For your property to appreciate in price, there must be some external factor that drives it. Of course, underlying everything or rather supporting growth of properties across the board will be Singapore's economy. It's common mm-hmm. sense, right? Mm-hmm. If Singapore were like Afghanistan, how much will property be worth? So it's common sense that properties in Singapore do well because Singapore's economy is still doing fine. Singapore is still relevant to the global economy. So from the big picture perspective, all still look good. We'll have a look at the more specific factors so, of course, looking at Singapore, uh, look at the master plan. Um, be familiar with where all the new growth areas are going to be. I think by now, a lot of Singaporeans know growth will come from um, new development. So, we have the Greater Southern Waterfront that's taking place. The government wants to develop uh, woodlands into a second, you know, Jurong East. So, there's going to be another CBD you know, happening in uh, woodlands. And, of course, in Pongo, we have this new digital corridor so you have all these new industries that's going to bring more employment into the place, more vibrancy. So these are the activities that um, and developments that all home buyers should be aware of. So you know that if I buy this place, five years later, ten years later, is the place going to be more vibrant? Will there be more activities? Because all this will drive up the price of your property. Okay, so that's really looking at it from an investment point of view, which is the thing that I said I want to ask about. So like, is it okay to look at my home as an investment? Yes, you can. Yeah. The government wish you don't look at it too much as an investment. Um, but yes, of course, you definitely can. But of course, you know, people buy properties for different motivations as well. Some buy it because they just want their children to be within one kilometer from the prestigious primary school. Because I think not everyone believes that all schools are good schools. Some schools are better than other schools. <laughs> oh, okay. This is a <laughs> sensitive topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So investment growth and, and the potential is, I mean, since we are looking at it from a point of view, that, okay, I, I buy my home to stay, but at the same time, I also want growth. Yes. In the event yes. that I can sell and then move or, you know, upgrade. The Singaporean dream that we're talking about. That's so investment right. potential. We talk about two things. The economy. Well, something that I really cannot control, the, the Singapore economy in this case. Yep. But what I can look at is the, the areas of growth and you mentioned three areas. The Southern right. Waterfront, the Pongo, and the second Jurong East and they'll be at Woodlands. Right? So, right. so these few areas, take a look at the map and see where yeah, the potential is. Yeah, all the is, plans right? are all public information. You just go to the URA website. It's all there and it's so fun to read. So I encourage all listeners to just explore the URA website, go to the master plan, look at all the different districts that uh, the government is going to pump in more money to make it more vibrant. Yeah, please. Mm. Of course, personal preferences come into play. Some people prefer to live in the east. Some people prefer a certain area. So, I mean, you need to balance that with the... Exactly. Yeah, there are some hardcore Eastlanders who will yeah. never move out of East Coast area. East side, best side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then they say their food is better than the... Uh, it is. <laughs> everywhere else. I'm not even saying I think. It is. <laughs> An okay. objective statement. <laughs> okay, then you win, you win. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, you, you just overlay the two things together. Well, you have your own preferences because it's your ultimately your home. But yes. at the same time, okay, like if you're looking at it, hopefully there's some potential gains from it Then you need to balance it out with the, the map that you're talking about. That's okay. right. Any other things? I guess there's this um, 
perennial debate, what is better? Should I buy resale? Should I buy brand new? And shed a light on how we can think about this. Because again, there's no right or wrong. I guess if you're going to be very clear cut about this, if you're wrong, it means that you lose money. Lah. If you're right, you make money, yeah, whether you go to resale or brand new. So let's talk about um, the, the top process. So a lot of folks, they look at the new launches and they'll say, wow, it's more expensive than the previous launches. But there is a reason why new launches are more expensive. Look, developers also want to sell their projects at a good price. That is good for them and good for you. They price it too high, they'll take forever to sell. It's bad for them and their cash flow. So things are getting more expensive for a very simple reason. Land cost is more expensive. If you read the news, you know how um, labor cost has gone up, construction cost has gone up, and even Great Earth construction you know, recently went belly up. I don't know what happened to them, but it's quite sad for me to read because they have been around for so long building all kinds of projects in Singapore. So there are a lot of cost pressures and all this is built into the final launch price of any new project. And of course, a new project comes with a brand new lease compared to older project that maybe has been around for 10 years. So things will just get more expensive. This is how it is. So some folks will then go to the resale market. And when they go to the resale market, Sometimes you realize that how come resale market is attractive because the price is cheaper. But the price don't seem to go up a lot compared to a new launch after three, four years when it's ready for occupancy. You see people flipping the project for 10, 15, 20% profit. So they're wondering, why is this the case? So hopefully, um, without any diagrams, I can sort of explain uh, what's happening. So in the resale market, so let's say you're looking at a project that was so 20 years ago, uh, let's say in 2020, right? A million dollars, right? At that point in time, the first owner bought it for a million dollars. Now, when you're looking at the project, you're comparing to another similar project, brand new, that is now s- selling, let's say same, s- similar specs, similar location, Okay, just to be fair, similar lo- location, uh, but, you know, space still some distance apart. So the new one is going for maybe 1,004 PSF. Everything is newer, facilities are newer, maybe it's more modern. So you decide, why not I buy the resale project? Maybe I can buy it for 1,003, which is $100 cheaper than the brand new project, which let's say is selling at 1,004. Mm. So after you buy a thousand three, you look to your neighbor and realize that, hey, how come eventually a thousand four, this guy can sell at thousand six? But at thousand three, I'm struggling to find someone who can pay me higher. So what is the logic? The logic is because you have bought from the first buyer who had bought it at one million, you bought it at one point three. Now you're hoping that somebody else will buy from you at a higher price. But this guy who you hope will buy from you at a higher price has a choice. He can go back to the original first owners and negotiate a price lower than what you would expect. And these guys are the first owners, those who bought in year 2000. They will be sitting on a larger profit just by selling less than what you're asking for. That is the dynamics why in the resale market, sometimes for certain projects, the price acquisition is not a lot because people will try to buy from the original owners who might actually ask for less because they are resting on a nice profit cushion. So it will take some time before you as a second owner of the same unit to get a higher price. Yeah. So I am someone who bought it from another person who bought it 20 years ago. Yeah. So I have a neighbor who bought it 20 years ago and is still holding on to it. So yes. in a way... Because it all depends on who's supplying, right? And you know, my neighbor is my competitor in terms of this exactly this product that I'm trying to sell, exactly. right? In this case, our home. Okay? Exactly. And then at the same time, um, let's say you bought a, a new launch, and therefore your competitor is your neighbor who also bought the new launch together with you at the same time, and yes. you all want a, a better profit, right? You all want the Correct. higher than thousand four, maybe thousand five per square yeah. feet or something. Yeah. So whereas my neighbor, because he or she is already earning a, a tidy profit, they That's don't right. mind something lower. You know, and yeah. there are many reasons for accepting a lower price. Maybe they're really okay with it. Maybe you really want to move or downsize, whatever, whatever you, right? So, so therefore, I 
find it harder to justify my increase in price. Correct. You, you got it exactly. Is so, that the main reason? That is actually uh, one of the major reasons okay. because end of the day, everybody wants to sell his property at the highest possible price. Unless he's the only one in the whole development selling, then it's good for him because he has no other competitors. No one else wants to sell. But if everyone else is also selling, they will start to sell slightly lower than your asking price to clear. And if he's happy at earning 250 PSF, where else you have to sell? Let's say it's profit of 250 PSF. Uh, it's such that you would only earn 50 PSF if you were to sell. Would you sell as a second owner? No. You will say, I will just hold. And then you have to wait for all the other guys to sell until you have a lot of second owners owning the place before your asking price become reasonable. So I should be checking the transactions around my area, right? If yes. I want to sell or if I want to look at potential, uh, potentially selling this place in the future. Yeah, so different projects have different uh, characteristics. So for example, uh, now that we're on this kind of projects as well, sometimes you have very big projects with a lot of transactions, very good. Because when you want to sell, there's a good reference point for potential buyers to refer to it to offer. Some projects, hardly anybody sell. And maybe the last transaction was five, six years ago. And then now you're asking for a pretty high price and the buyer will come to you and say, hey, I'm offering you what I think is a good price. And if you look at the last transaction price five years ago, I'm really paying you 15% more. Is that not enough? Okay, because that's the only reference point available. Yeah. And of course, he's not going to low boy and pay your price five years ago. He's only paying a 15% premium. But mm. of course, you want more. But how do you justify when there's no transaction within your development to support it? So, it's very hard for such smaller developments unless the buyer loves it so much. The feng shui is a perfect fit. He doesn't look at any past transaction. He just wants it all cost. Then you're one lucky seller. So yeah. apart from looking at the price per square feet, you're also looking at the transaction volume around the area. Yeah. That plays a part as well. So it's good to have a development where it's not too big, not, not too small. Uh, big enough to have a healthy volume of transaction, even for renter as well. Yeah, because some of you listeners might want, want to rent out your apartments eventually. And yeah, imagine there's no renter mm -hmm. transaction data. Everyone just buying to stay. Where's the benchmark? Okay. It yeah. depends on whether it's an area where people need to go to work, right? I mean, yeah. most people are using it for residential then, okay, unless you can find a tenant in that case, but it might be harder yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. That's yeah. interesting because I think people will think, oh, okay, new new launch versus resale. Why is new launch more expensive? Well, because more more lease, right? I mean, there's, there's more years in the lease. Yeah, that's logical, right? I mean, and that will be the first reason that I, I will be thinking of. But yeah. what you're saying is that, okay, there, there's also how the market is doing. We have to look at how the market is doing, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Going back to an earlier point, you also mentioned budgeting. Like what are the mm. things to look out for for a first-time home buyer budgeting? Like how would you advise someone on how they should budget for their home? Well, it's not much a hidden cost. You have to account for your stamp duty, which is a very standard calculation. If your property is one million or less, it's just um, three percent minus five thousand four hundred. If your resi property is more than one million dollars, the formula to use is four percent times your purchase price minus one five four hundred. So there's a stamp duty that you have to pay. There's no escape, sorry guys. Um, no matter how, you can't escape stamp duty. And the next thing to pay is your legal fees, which for a typical $1 million each condo would probably set you back about 2003 in legal fees. Uh, it goes a bit higher once your purchase price uh, goes higher as well. But it's, it's a small sum in the whole scheme of things, right? Stamp duty. Uh, sorry, um, the, the legal fees, sorry. Legal fees, yeah. Yep. And... Yeah, that's about it. No other hidden fees. That is if you are buying, of course, brand new from the developer. So if you are buying in the resale market, well, the good thing is whether you engage an agent or not, you don't have to pay any agent fees because if an agent represents you, shares his agent fees with the seller's agent. Yeah. Whether you want to say, oh, that has been already factored in the selling price. I mean, I leave it to imagination how you want it mm. um, to be calculated within the eventual selling price but uh, it's not exactly a cost you have to pay once you agree on the purchase price so I've mentioned so legal fees stamp duty that's about it and after that it will be your 
um, renovation fees, how much you want to spend. And that is something you can actually control. Well, it, it actually ranges. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at all sorts of numbers. Mm. Yes, yes. You want something that can appear in a home deco magazine, of course, it's a few hundred thousand dollars. Right. You want something oh. basic enough to stay, 30, 40, 50K will be good enough. Okay, okay. Yeah. And of course, if you stay whether in HDB or a condo, you have to take into account your maintenance fees. Mm, that will add to... For condos, uh, it's pretty typical. A one bedder, if it's not a very uh, luxurious condo, a one bedder will set you back in terms of maintenance fee about 200 plus. But of course, as the development gets older, you would add on another component called a sinking fee. And that might add things to 300 plus. So these are costs that you have to factor down the road. And there's no escape. Hmm. So yeah. buyer stamp duty, like you mentioned, um, legal fees and if you're buying a condo there's the, the maintenance fees as well and yeah, of course right. uh, after factoring all of these in there's the, the initial deposit that you need to have so make sure you have cash for those and very soon once you get the keys you need to renovate so that's the but renovation or if it's a new launch then it's still somewhere down the line yeah I don't have to do too much I mean mm. you know, all new condos come with uh, white goods and um, cabinets and all all you need is to fix the lights move in your sofa, bed, a TV cabinet, and basically that's about it. <laughs> mm. Then how about the, the monthly mortgage? Like what, what percentage do you think it should be of your income? Uh, yeah, the well, the government, yeah, the government has already um, set <laughs> just the rules. So follow it. <laughs> yeah, just, just follow it. Yeah. Okay. okay yeah, just okay. follow it. Of course, uh, I mean, it's a matter go, of preference. Go close to it. <laughs> yeah, close to it. Right. You can't exit it anyway. Mm. Uh, and, um, okay. How much you want to take, of course, some folks um, want to maximize the loans mm. uh, for a very simple reason because um, the mortgage rate in Singapore is exceptionally low. If you compare our mm. mortgage rate with our neighboring countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, man, our interest rates is abnormally low. So folks, a lot of folks, they maximize their mortgage on the first property because they know that if they were to maybe reserve some money and then use it to buy a second property, they'll be hit with additional taxes like ABSD and they can't take a full mortgage anyway. So a lot of folks, they just maximize the loan on the first property. Um, it's fine, but make sure that it's within your budget. Mm. Yeah, so you can go all in Yep, as long as it doesn't um, overstretch you. Okay. So earlier on, we also talk about resale versus new launch. Mm. But let's go to another debate, which right. is uh, for your first property, HDB or private? Wow, it's classic, man. Classic. I, get, I get that almost every day. Um, okay, are, are you comparing uh, BTO, HDB, resale, HDB? Yeah, of course, again, that comes out. Yeah, we need to talk about both of them. more permutations yeah, here. That's right, that's right. Go through some of the, the examples, like maybe some clients they've handled so you can get a better idea of how to compare them. Okay, right. Mm. So all you Singaporeans know that if you go straight to BTO, you are paying direct price, right? On theory, you get the best price because it is sold by the government. The only downside is you have to wait, right? Unless you're talking about those um, balance over HDB flats which you can actually ballot and move in straight away because it's already built but for some reason the unit were not sold or they were returned by the uh, original buyer. Um, assuming you're buying a typical brand new BTO from government and you know due to COVID and all the de construction delays now you have to wait up to six years. Oh yeah, five, six years. Yeah, <laughs> five, six time. years <laughs> assuming you apply with your boyfriend or girlfriend who knows if you guys are still together after six years. <laughs> Affects family planning, man. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, and you don't really get to choose where you want to stay unless the locations that they are launched are your dream locations, fine. So you don't have much choices in terms of uh, where you want to stay in terms of the new launch. The government decides where you want to build new flats. So that, if you can live with the downside, that means it might take up to six years and you can't sell until five years of MOP. Ten years. <laughs> yeah. It's a long then time. Yeah. Go ahead. Fine. I mean... Okay. Why not, right? If you can't wait because your baby's on the way, just go to resale. Mm. A lot of choices out there. And um, whether you want to buy a new resale, as in a resale that has just cleared its five MOP and pay a higher price, 
or buy a resale that is like 40 years old, but in a choice location and definitely cheaper, it's a good choice as well. There's no right or wrong. Of course, the main concern of a lot of folks is that if I buy an old resale, left only 50 years, right? And with the government messaging that it's not likely that we're going to unblock every HDB flat. Mm. I think the number they threw out was only about 4% will get this SERS, selective um, upgrading. Then what should they be thinking at the back of their mind? Let's say they buy a HDB, nice HDB, with only 50 plus years of lease. How should they strategize? Well, very simple. If you're buying a 50-year-old or rather a HDB flat with 50 years of lease left, what you can do is you just see it as a home first, all right? To raise your family, at the same time, build up some capital. So eventually, this 5 beta HDB, you can either rent out for rental income for the remaining lease because you will have bought another place elsewhere already. If not, you can stay in it all the way and wait for new government initiatives to uh, to support the value. Because if you follow the news, the actual implementation of the um, government plans on how they're going to prop up the value has not really been finalized yet. But the government is doing its best to make sure that um, your value, if it declines, will be gradual. It won't be today you buy the HDB flat at 500k, tomorrow, next year you get a shock. How can it work only 300k? It's not going to happen, right? So if... Buying a resale HDB allows you to save 400k, 300k compared to buying a brand new resale. Then think about what are you going to do with a 300 and 400k of savings? Please don't just dump it in China stocks just because they're having a bargain sale now. We know what is happening recently in the China mm-hmm. stock market. Sea of red. So I see it as a more flexible way of deploying your funds. If you were to buy a cheaper resale HDB that has less lease left. That is why you look at it from a big picture view. You have a choice. No one is stopping you from buying a brand new, I won't say brand new, but a new resale like those that have been transacting at Clementi or the million dollar HDB. You are not forced to buy those. You can have a choice. You can always buy a way cheaper Clementi HDB with maybe 60 years left or maybe 70 years left and use that savings to do something else. Maybe you can spend it on a nice renovation, you know, whatever. But I think a very good plan would be if you were to buy a HDB that has only 50 plus years of lease left, think about how you're going to monetize it maybe 20 years down the road when you start to rent out. Because whether your HDB is old or new, you can still fetch very good rental as long as it is has all the killer factors near MRT. Amenities. Amenities, yeah. yeah. And that is good enough because... From what I know, our HDBs are designed to last more than 100 years. That's for safety. And I think uh, listeners will be assured, wow, you know, you do, what's the point of having a 99-year lease when, when your building starts to crumble in 50 years? Yeah. So what, from what I understand, our HDBs were built to pretty good specs. So you're looking at, we should be considering our personal circumstances. Exactly. And then on the other hand, there's also the investment point of view. So I, I get something with uh, less years in the lease. Correct. I have savings, right? And what I want to do with the savings, like, I need to think about it. Yeah. If you just take the savings and you don't know what to do with it. Yeah, just yeah. don't do anything rash. Please don't put your money in a Ponzi scam. You know, mm. all those scams out there. Because I know the thinking right now is that if I buy a brand new resale, when I were to sell it maybe 10 years down the road, I can probably sell it at a good price because there's still a lot of lease left. Same goes for, for the private property condo arguments, right? I am, well, it depends. Depends. But there's the impression that, okay, there's, there's more room for appreciation. Yeah, but the thing about prior property condo is that there is a chance for unblock. So no matter how short your lease is left, all the residents can agree that they will unblock. And as long as they have a reasonable price and a developer to come in to build and redevelop, they can exit out pretty, pretty nicely. So, But for HDB, uh, it depends on the government. The government decides which block it wants to you know, tear down rejuvenate and then, you know, bring the residents over to the next block. So the residents do not have a choice. It's all up the government. But as I mentioned, um, our HDBs are designed to last more than 100 years. So there are a few things that the government might do. I don't know. I'm just guessing. They could renew the lease, extend the lease. There are so many things they can do. But the thing is, the details are not out yet. So... Right now, it's a bit too early to speculate, but 
the government being the government, um, you know how it is in Singapore. Things are well planned. I'm sure they would know what to do to support the value. And even if there's a decline, it will be gradual. Yeah, but again, uh, who knows, right? Who knows if 30 years down the road, your HDB with less lease might actually be worth more than your buying price. So, mm, because of other yeah. reasons. Yeah, we don't know. Foreseen. Yeah, we don't okay. know. Since we're talking about investments and you know about investments, right. how should I see my property as part of my portfolio? Wow. Um, again, depends on your personal circumstances. If you are married with kids, I think first and foremost is your home. If you are single, like I know a lot of my friends who are single, guess what? The HDB that they buy is left empty. And I do ask them, why you buy? Ah? <laughs> and interesting enough, a typical answer will be not married, CPF not used, got a chance to buy, just buy first law. Mm-hmm. Then later decide what to do. I'm like, <laughs> And you know, they can't rent out the entire place within the first five years. So um, some of them just leave it vacant. Some will actually stay there and rent out the spare rooms. So, so they're still staying at their own place? Hmm? They bought a place, but they're still So some of them, uh, interesting enough, they're still bunking with their, with their parents. Parents, uh-huh. Because they bought, so they bought their own HDB, right? Right, right, right. They just leave it vacant. Some, they actually move in the HDB, but because they're single, whatever spare rooms they have, they rent out. And that is allowed. You just can't rent out the entire mm-hmm. um, unit. Because staying there, yep. Yes, within the first five years. So mm. for them, I'm sure they see it more as an investment because straight away they are renting out for those who rent out for those who are just leaving it vacant I always ask them so what are you planning to do oh I will sell law after five years so I say ah, really <laughs> okay so because they, they see it as an investment but well I think it's affordable because um, a lot of them hmm. um, they probably find the, um, the cheapest um, condo out of reach so just go for the next best thing which is a resale HDB because if resale HDB if you're not too particular you can get a three bedroom for 300 plus K and location is pretty decent as well so why not so let me look at it another way so what is your advice to someone who wants to in- invest in property if you invest in property um, for private properties you have of course less restrictions right there's no MOP to speak of, you just need to clear three years before you escape the seller stamp duty penalties. There's no restriction in terms of renting your apartment. You can rent out to s pass, EP, work permit holders. But do you know for HDBs, there are certain class of work permit holders that you cannot rent to. They also segregate by their industries that they're in. So there's a lot more rules when it comes to HDB. Yeah, so that restricts who you can rent to, right? And your potential yes. pool of tenants, okay. Potential pool of tenants. For investments, definitely, from a very practical point of view, if you can afford it, it's always the private sector, right? And that is also why the government is more, I won't say hands-free, but they don't regulate private residential properties as much as the HDB of our public housing. So again, like I mentioned so many times, it's personal circumstances. So if you are single, I think it's easy for any single to buy a one bader, two bader in the private market and either flip it uh, ASAP when, you know, he can make a profit or at least he can stay in one room and rent out the other room in the time being just to cover some of his costs. Um, HDB, no matter how you see it, I think um, it should first and foremost be seen as a place to stay. And of course, if you can sell a profit, it's, it's good for you. But I think young people must start to think about not putting everything in the property. Yes, because... Once you have a roof over your head, I think that really saves you a lot of uh, inconvenience. I mean, some folks just can't tolerate staying their parents anymore. The nagging, the... Oh, yeah, there are mm, newspaper articles, the young madness. people like 21 years old, 22 years old moving out. Yeah. Either they rent or... Yeah, that, that's a trend. It's mm. a trend. I think it's actually good. It builds up independence earlier. You don't have to rely on your mom to do your laundry and to shout at you to bathe. It's this cultural thing. I mean, well, from my understanding like in the US if you're like you know 18 years old and you're not, not out right <laughs> you know like you know go go find out and rent your own place yeah, yeah but in Asia we're kind of we have different values exactly. different culture exactly so yeah I guess the answers to the question um, for investment practical reasons just go for private property but of course again within what you can afford mm. don't overstretch um, you want to combine with your friends if you're like-minded friends who have the same exit plan as you fine if not you just have to do it on your own. All right. Yeah. Any last words to say to our home 
uh, first time home buyers listening on this podcast? First time home buyers. Mm. Um, there's no rocket science to purchasing your first home. There's no need to attend some rara expensive course out there that, you know, charge you a leg and arm just to learn very basic stuff and then try to offload you some properties. I think if you just ask around and I think you have a lot of good platforms now, right? Financial Coconut is one. You have the Seedly platform. There's so much resources for you to research on what is a suitable buy for you. Yeah. I won't say goodbye because everyone has their own goodbye. So my goodbye might not be a goodbye, but it works for my circumstances. So I think it's important to just choose something that is tailored fit to your own financial means, circumstances. You know, you don't have to be envious of someone who buys something more fancy than you because this is just your first property. It might not be your last property. I think a lot of folks will buy two properties in their lifetime. So buy something you can afford, make sure you have a lot of breathing space. And after that, you can explore what alternatives you want, right? It might not even be another property. It might be investments, you know, stock market and whatever. But the same thing when you buy your first property, whatever else you invest in, please do your due diligence, right? Ask around. There's so much more information these days compared to our parents' generation 30, 40 years ago. So there's no excuse not to make a suitable decision. Yeah, so that's my parting words. Okay, thank you, Douglas. Thank you for listening all the way here. Stay after this outro because usually we have some bonus content right at the end. It's like the end credit scene of a movie. But before that, I hope you've learned something useful today. If you like more of this content, join our Telegram group, follow us on social media, sign up for our newsletter. For all this and more, check out thefinancialcoconut.com. My name is Andrew. Stay tuned for the next episode of Chill with the Financial Coconuts. Last three questions for you. You have, uh? yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> yeah. It's more, more personal to you. Okay, okay. Uh, what is one core life principle that you have? Core life principle. Wow, so deep, uh, so big, so heavy. Okay, core life principle. You know, try to do good. Um, don't scam. Don't con. Don't envy. And if you look around us, there are always people more successful than us. So don't show off because it's so embarrassing when people who are so much more successful than you don't blow their own trumpet. And I think we have to be able to feel genuine joy for friends who have succeeded. You know, of course, hopefully they do it the legit way. And you should feel happy for them. You should applaud their effort. And then just challenge yourself to be the best version of yourself. Look, I know there's a lot of news or a lot of entrepreneurs buying GCBs, right? So please don't think that you don't buy a GCB, you're a failure. No, no, please, please. You are more than just a vessel for accumulating assets. Think about, okay, maybe when you are a bit more comfortable in your life, what can you do for others, right? Anything that you can do for others in small ways or big ways, I think that will add some spark to your life. Okay, don't be a mindless asset accumulating monster. Yeah, it it never ends, right? You start comparing uh, what cars your friends are driving compared to you, what watches they are wearing. You know, this is, no one cares once you are gone, what you have own, you know, I think it's a lot more than that. So when you have time, uh, young people, not so young people, maybe sit back and think about the things that you're doing. What are you actually doing it for? A lot of us, especially guys, okay, I don't want to discriminate. The guys that I know, I think we just try to challenge ourselves to see if we go to a particular direction, how far can we go? And I think as long as we take that approach and not trying to look over our shoulder and see, you know, how many kilometers this guy is doing on his treadmill and the other guy on his treadmill. We'll be a lot happier. Yeah, I think happiness is something that uh, is important. But I will try to phrase it in another way. But uh, yeah, there has to be. So I think it's, it's not a core value. Lah. It's just a general philosophy on how mm. I think we have to sometimes sit back and I won't say get out of the rat race lah, because you're not a rat if you don't think you're a rat, right? You are what you are and you just do stuff to the best of your ability and if you can you know you help folks who are maybe a uh, disadvantage or you know need a bit of help that's about it okay hmm. what is one piece of financial advice wow. that you think should be shared more often Whew. people are not hearing oh. enough um, I think there's so much so much uh, conventional advice out there right things like if it's too good to be true it's definitely not true now that is actually quite true <laughs> 
But I think we all need to be educated. But it's hard to be educated when all of us come from different backgrounds, right? Like some people are so easily suckered into Ponzi scams because they are not exposed, whether through work, life experience or education, on identifying whether certain things are true or not true. So I think education is a continuous process that must be uh, inculcated, especially when folks are young. Like for example, I wish when I was younger, I had a stock investment class in secondary school, you know, something that would really, really help me. So maybe the only advice I would try to emphasize is keep an open mind, but not so open that any rubbish that comes your way, you just take it and oh, True. Uh. Always do a due diligence. Try on a smaller scale. If it works, then maybe go bigger. Okay, nicely wrapped up. The last question for you will be, what is one area of your life that you're giving additional focus right now? Additional focus, I think that will be my parents. Uh, I'm in my 40s already. So my parents are in their 70s. So, you know, just like a HDB lease, right? Not much lease left. Huh? Mm, most folks are <laughs> okay. last 99 years, right? Mm. So, um, I think once this whole COVID pandemic or endemic, whatever you call it, has sort of died down, I think we will start to go traveling again and just try to build more happy memories uh, while everyone is still around. I think that will be, yeah, something important to do, right? Because, you know, once they are gone, they're gone, right? You can't, you can't buy new parents. You can buy new properties, but you can't buy new parents. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Douglas. Welcome. Thank you. Signing off. All good. Everyone gets AT&T's best deal on the new iPhone 14 Pro with the incredible camera. So, people currently listening to comedy podcasts and people listening to political podcasts and people listening to true crime podcasts who actually can't stop listening to true crime podcasts and it's ruling their lives. The point is, everyone, new and existing customers. Ask how to get up to $800 off the new iPhone 14 Pro with eligible trade-in. Visit att.com or our stores for details. Terms and restrictions may apply.